Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
chapter 7. You might need to close those back doors, please. Thank you. I think she read my mind. <laughs> I know, it's such a strange thing. (laughs) 
Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. How be it, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life. I'm sorry. Everlasting. That's verse 16. I need to jump back to verse 15. <laughs> this is the faithful saying and worthy of all ex acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. If you ever want to take your, your AB people and, and mess with them, read scriptures out of order. <laughs> wow! I was just playing. Oh, I messed up. Yeah, exactly. Is she on top of things? Keep her on her toes. No falling asleep there. Acts chapter 7. We are so we are familiar with these portions of scriptures. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, wonder what would have been the outcome if he wasn't full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Think about that for a minute. Looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped with their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Amen. Our focus verse this morning is taken from 1 Timothy 1 and 15. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. Dear Lord, I love you, Lord. I appreciate you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for what we have to gather together. I pray, Lord, we never want to take these opportunities for granted. We want to be able to take full advantage of every and each opportunity we have to worship and serve you, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name you open up our hearts and our minds to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's lesson is entitled, Chiefest of Sinners. Chiefest of Sinners. A September day in Chicago, a stern-faced, plainly-dressed man was seen standing on a street corner in a busy loop. As people were hurrying about the solemnly, he solemnly lifted his right arm, pointed to the nearest person, and loudly said a single word, guilty. He did this without any change of expression, resumed his stiff stance for a short period, and repeated the process again. Over and over, he raised his right arm, pointed to a person, and declared, guilty. The reaction of the pedestrians were almost eerie. It was as if they did not know how to respond. One man, describing how many others likely felt, turned to another person and exclaimed, but how did he know? Paul declared that he was the chiefest of sinners. That recognition allowed him to also realize that the only way to remove the guilt and the shame of sin was to be open and honest before God. Amen. How did the young man know? All he really had to know was all have sinned right. and fallen short of the glory of God. It's all he had to know. And when you randomly point out or pick out people, it's going to be inevitable. They fall under the category of all. And all carry guilt. Some kind. To some extent. 
to some point. Amen. So it was inevitable that he was going to point at people and say, guilty, and they're going to say, how in the world did he know? Why? Because that's how we are. And Paul declared, I am the chiefest of sinners. Amen. So although Stephen is not mentioned often in the New Testament, the book of Acts gives us insight to just how important he was to the kingdom of God. Acts 6, 8 tells us that he was filled with faith and power. The word faith here is more properly interpreted as grace. His life was marked by being filled with the grace and power of God. We look at these scriptures and the first question I want to ask myself is, how would I have responded? Our first human instinct is always to protect ourselves. <clears throat> to survive. To declare our innocence. The verse goes on to tell us that Stephen did did great signs and wonders among the people. It takes faith and power for the works of God to be manifest in our lives. But too many people want the blessings of God to flow through them, I like this, but are not willing to fill their lives with the grace and power necessary for that to happen. Amen. We want the, the blessings and the greatness of God in our lives, but we're not willing to pay the price. We're not willing to do what's necessary for that to happen. Our liberty to say yes to God comes only from our discipline to say no to sin. Hmm. If we spend our whole time saying yes to sin, <clears throat> then we should be shocked if we don't have the power and the blessings of God working in our lives. Why does that always catch us by surprise? So Stephen made it a practice to preach wherever he could. And in doing so, five synagogues rose against him according to Acts 6-9. This word arose means they stood up against him. These Grecian Jews felt threatened by the message Stephen preached. They were holding to their Jewish beliefs and the preaching of Christ stirred up the people. The enemy never likes truth to be preached. That's why he obscures the truth. Amen? To the point where sometimes you can't even detect the truth. When I was younger, my dad had a, a, a metal detector, a coin detector. And we would, we would go out, you know, sometimes, and my dad would take it out, and it was my, 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 my job, my brother's job, to go behind him wherever, beep, you heard the sound you dig up to see what was there. Anticipating a treasure of some kind. It was the era of the bottle caps. Yeah. <laughs> That's the size of a coin and you get excited and realize it's just a bottle cap.
Amen. Obscure the truth. It, it obscure. So even it would have been nice to be able to say take it and just just put it on a setting that says it only goes off when it when it hits a treasure. But it was a metal detector. And his main purpose was to detect metal, not necessarily treasure. He will do whatever is necessary to, I like this, if this word doesn't describe today, it's going to after today. In sight, people to rise up. Right. What happens? When you don't know what truth is, it's easy to believe what you're told. And unfortunately, the ones that are spreading the lies are louder and obscure the ones that are preaching and spreading truth. So when the lies are being perpetrated, it's easy to incite people to rise up against the truth. Oh, and I love it how more, most people don't even know what they're fighting for. Right. They saw his preaching of Christ as the supreme sacrifice, I'm sorry, the Grecian Jews were becoming a tool of the enemy in their opposition to Stephen. They saw his preaching of Christ as the supreme sacrifice, the Messiah, as a threat to what they had already or always believed. Now, We've got to stop here for a second and look at something, okay? Here is a inevitable truth. We want to look at this. We want to say these people are bad. They were bad the way they treated Stephen, right? Mm -hmm. How terrible. Right. Let me point something out to you and everybody listening. They were in the right. Because they weren't willing to accept the new covenant. Right. So based on the old covenant, which is the way they lived their life, right. they were in the right. right. And Stephen was in the wrong. Right. Uh -huh. Oh. What does that mean for us today? We need to be careful sometimes of the traditions and the laws we try to enforce. That obscure the new covenant. And sometimes when we preach truth, their message was truth too. In a day and era. Yes, amen. Before the cross. Uh-huh. Now the cross and Stephen's message became the new message. Mm -hmm. It's still the old message. Mm -hmm. right. amen. Uh -huh. If they would have listened to what Stephen was saying, uh -huh. they would have understood that the old message and the new message were the same. Uh -huh. yes. Right. Yes. Right. 
It's just that the tablets were replaced by a man yes. named Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Amen. Could you please turn that off? I've got a blue dot. So whenever I read something yeah. in my, my, my peripheral is picking up that blue light close. And, I, and I'm, I'm reading and I'm like, why do I got this blue light in the middle? I, I think I'm getting ill or something. I'm like, I think I'm going blind. Yeah. How in the world is happening? And then it dawned on me, I'm looking at this and I'm realizing, why does that look like the spotlight? And then, <laughs> whew, give me a chance. My eyes to refocus here. Yeah. The, they were both wrapped up in truth, but... Stephen's message took them into the new covenant, a new dispensation, a new message, or a new way to declare the old message. Amen. Amen. And how sometimes the enemy can get us so focused on, on, Oh, this is the way we used to do it. Uh, yep. How we don't realize how that attitude mm -hmm. right. can damper a fresh move. Right. How many times have we heard? I've, I've heard elders say, well, this church just isn't like it used to be. Well, how did it used to be? I was always interested in, and what was it? What, what, how is it different? Because the object of our worship hasn't changed. Right. So what, what is different? The message hasn't changed. Right. Truth hasn't changed. Yeah. So what's changed? We've gotten older. Right. His message of Jesus Christ Jesus as a deliverer is a threat to their way of living. Sin has not only made them comfortable, it has also emboldened them against the church. We can open up everything else but churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I mean, that's bold. No, I don't want to say it. Oh, come on, you know you do. It's got to be said. It's wrong. It's bold. It's blatant. It's in your face. Right. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. Right. They're not even trying to, trying to, trying to, to, um, <clears throat> be secret about the agenda. The whole agenda has always been about shutting down the church and the people right. that, that preach truth. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. And stand up for what is right. Mm -hmm. It drives them nuts to know that the country that we live in is a, is a Christian country. Right. Right. Amen. And I'm tired of people who say that they're Christians and then they sell themselves out. Right. Amen. Amen. To support the lie. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. The very thing they need the most is deliverance. Amen. 
which is the very thing which is being rejected because of what they want the most is sin. It's easy to sin when you are living in a sea of sin. Right. It's easy to cover it up. It's easy to hide. It's easy to feel good about yourself. Right. But all of a sudden, when you're confronted with a Stephen that stands up and says you're in the wrong right. and singles out the sin, right. well, then that's what we got to silence. We don't need somebody telling us we're doing something wrong. We already feel guilty about it, but we don't need somebody to tell us right. that we're doing something wrong. We want to be able to continue it without even, without people knowing it. Right. And I know what's best. I will fix it and correct it myself. Yeah. Come on. Uh -huh. Amen. And then we stand up and say, but we're a Christian nation and God we trust. And all of this kind of stuff. But we allow them to take God out of every institution. Right. Because a minimum, a minority number of people are offended. Right. Hello? Right. I didn't say race of people. I said the minority number of people. Right. Correct. Not the majority, but the minority. That's right, right. Got their way. Because right. yeah. the majority went silent. Yeah, right. why, why is that? I'll explain it the easiest way I could do it. Is because the majority who make a claim is like Paul who says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Rather than trying to correct our mistakes and rather than trying to correct our movements, we just secretively support the sin. Why? Because we secretly support the sin in our own lives. You know what I'm saying? So outwardly we can tell people that I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. But inwardly, we support. Why? Why do you say we support? I, I, I hate all this stuff. But when you don't stand against it, you support it. When you don't take a stand, you're supporting it. Right? Or am I crazy? Stephen stood for what he believed and what he was preaching, the message. Yeah. And the people got angry at him, not because he was preaching, but because he was making them feel uncomfortable. Right. And so they went at him the way, the only way that they could, and they ended up stoning him. Right. And essentially, when they threw their cloaks and their clothes at the feet of Saul, what they were essentially doing was passing that kind of mantle right. onto a man. Right that they trusted to continue yep. this persecution. Mm -hmm. So the leaders of these five synagogues realized they would not prevail. So they appealed to the people, causing them to turn against Stephen. Acts 6 and 12 actually use the words, stirred up the people. I always love it when the guilty tries to surround themselves with a quorum. So this violent, this suggests a violent shaking like a volcano. Sin is never content to just create a small disturbance. It wants to shake and destroy everything around it. The more people that could be stirred up against Stephen, 
the better the chance there was to silence him. The better the chance there was, was to cover up their own guilt and sin. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if I get people to join me, it'll put them in the same boat as I'm in. Right. If you are rowing in a boat that's sinking, just because you fill it up with a bunch of people, doesn't mean that that boat's automatically going to stop sinking. Right. You know what that means? That means a boat could take on water faster. Right. Hello? It's how sin works. But that's how we do it. Makes us feel better. It doesn't resolve the sin. It just makes us feel better about our sin. Right. So the more people we get on board, that's why we that's why we surround ourselves with people that believe and teach and practice the same things we believe and teach and practice. Right. Why? Because the more people in the crowd, the better the chance we have of covering up our own flaws. Right. I love it when people so quickly want to point out my flaws, but yet ignore the fact that they have flaws of their own. Right. But they make it sound like your flaws are worse than my flaws. Excuse me. A flaw is a flaw. A sin is a sin in the Word of God. It doesn't matter what it's called or what, it's, what it is. God just calls it all sin. <laughs> There's no level of severity. Often we do not see what is going on behind the scenes. So in the realm of the spirit, Stephen was seeing great revival as a result of his ministry. We need to think about this for a second. We can look at the situation and say, oh, Stephen. If he would have just had a chance to preach a revival message. If he would have just had a chance to survive and go on to preach again somewhere else. I wonder how many people he would have stirred up and how many people he would have changed. What kind of preacher would he have been if he would have been allowed to preach one more sermon? If he would have been allowed, the best sermon he ever preached was... God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right. That was the best message you could have preached because Stephen didn't even know the hearts and lives that was going to be changed through that one message yeah. through the man named Saul. Right. Saul is a descendant of Stephen's message. Yes. And every church that was planted and started by the man named Paul. Every missionary journey, every heart that was turned and moved towards God was all in relationship to Stephen. Right. <clears throat> Stephen was seeing great revivals result of his ministry. People were being converted and lives were being changed. Satan fights against truth, especially in instances when people turn from sin. I like this. The more opposition we face, it means the closer we are to revival. Oh, church. We may think, oh man, we haven't faced anything like this we're facing today. Let me point something out to you. The enemy knows his time is running out. And he knows that there's a great revival on the horizon. Church, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared for that revival. We need to be, be open to it. And we need to be prepared. Oh, This is a prime opportunity. Whenever we see the hand of the enemy moving more and more and more against the church, we need to rejoice more and more and more yeah. because that means revival is around the bend. Yeah. That means a change is coming. Yeah. Amen. And he doesn't want it. Yeah. Amen. During the greatest seasons of revival, the enemy will fight us the most. 
Amen. 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 When things are routine and mundane, he has no real need to rise up against us. Ooh. Listen to those words. When the, when the things, or when church becomes routine and mundane, there is no real need for him to rise up against us. We can't let church get to be routine and mundane. Oh, we come to church, we sing a few songs, we do this, we do that. It's fallen right into a category. And, and no, we need, first of all, we need to not put our walk with God on the shoulders of somebody else's life. That's right, amen. We need to take responsibility for our own walk with God. Amen. And if things become routine, it's because I become routine, yeah. not because so and so becomes routine. That's right. Right. If yeah. if church becomes mundane, it's not because it's not because I become. It has to be because I became mundane, not because somebody else became right. mundane. Right. Amen. 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 Yeah. You know what? You can have some people who function in routine and mundane, and yet side sitting next to them is another person who is. Is, is functioning in being on fire and in revival. Amen. It is possible to see Amen. two, those two different diversities of people sitting on the same pew. Amen. Why? Because our mindset is our mindset. Right. When the church is on fire and people are being born again, the enemy takes note. Uh -huh. Oh. It is then that he will stir up the people to rise against the church. This pattern is shown to us in the book of Acts. So we should not be surprised when we see it actually happen in our midst. Oh man, I'm running out of time. Sin is a head, heart, and spirit issue. Right. Our heart should always be moved by the convicting truthfulness of God's word. Amen. Amen. You know what? And this is not a pass on sin. But let me point something out to you. We need to be thankful that the Word of God still convicts us. Amen. Because when it stops convicting us, yes. that means we've been turned over to a retrobate mind, and God no longer has control of us, and the enemy does. So we need to be thankful when we feel conviction. We ought to be nervous when we don't. We ought to be scared for our own lives Amen. when the Word of God no longer convicts us. Oh. The Bible says that when he was preaching conviction, the people were cut to the heart. I don't know how many times I've said I'm not here to tickle your ears or, or, or reach you on the mind level. I'm here to try to stir your heart. Amen. Why? Because it's, it's the heart that's going to affect the change. That's right. Amen. It, the mind can stop it. That's why we need, need to wear the helmet of salvation. Amen. So, 
they set out to get rid of or to destroy that very thing that caused conviction. They stopped their ears. What they decided to do was they did not want to hear another word Stephen had to say. But stopping their ears would not stop the voice of Stephen. The only way to do that was to silence him once and for all time. So they allowed the sin that had intoxicated them with anger to drive them to murder. The worst thing that, that this world, and I, I wish I could say that, that there's somebody in the world out there that has the power and authority to, to bring about some change in our society, was listening to us tonight or this morning. But the very thing that they're trying to silence is the very thing that, that can save it. Amen. It is their desire to murder the church. Mm -hmm. But is the message of the church is the only thing that can save it. Right. Amen. Well, that's easy for you to say because you're on, you're on the side of the church. I'm not against the people. Right. Right. That's one thing we got to understand. The world is influenced by an enemy, a spiritual enemy that they cannot see and that they do not understand. They do not understand that, that, that enemy that walks around in the shadows, that, that speaks to their mind and, and, and perverts them and convinces them to do wrong. They, they can't see it and let alone understand it. It's not the people that concerns me. It's that whisperer. Amen. Romans 3 and 23. I'm going to close with this as soon as I'm done reading. For all have sinned, all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Thank mm -hmm. you.